there everyone and welcome back to season three this is so you got a scholarship the bi-weekly well supposed bi-weekly podcast that centers marginalized voices in academia inside and outside the classroom now i want to begin this episode by sending well wishes to everyone listening as the world is going through different stages of living through this current global pandemic I also want to say a huge, huge thank you to everyone who listens to the show and shares the show with their family, their friends, and to everyone who has supported us through Patreon or by buying our merch or in any other way, you absolutely keep us going. If you enjoyed this episode, the ones before, the ones coming, and you would like to get more content like this, please support our work on Patreon for as little as a cup of coffee per week or even per month. Honestly, just head on over to patreon.com forward slash sigspod. And if Patreon is not your thing, we have merch for you. So you can buy some funny tees, mugs, hoodies, or whatever it is that you'd like that is on our website, tedxmediahouse.com forward slash shop. The link to both these spaces is in the show notes and will be on our social media as well. So get yourself a t-shirt and you can support the show and get your swag on too. And honestly, that's a win-win if you ask me. Now, if none of this is something you're into, that's okay. Just like the podcast, share it with whoever you may need it. Um, Leave us a dazzling review, if possible, if that's how we made you feel, on Apple Podcasts or on iTunes and all the good stuff. Now, this episode is one that I've been looking forward to releasing since I recorded it last year, and you can blame the pandemic for that. Um, It's a bit of a lengthy one, but I assure you it's worth every second. I guarantee you that. This week, we have Dr. Laura Valadez Martinez, and Dr. Laura is a lecturer in social policy at Loughborough University. Her research specializes in income adequacy, poverty measurement, and childhood poverty and well being. Before that, she worked as a research associate at the Center for Research and Social Policy of Loughborough University. She has also been an online tutor on childhood policies for the Inter American Development Bank and a researcher for an international project on poverty funded by the European Union. Laura holds a PhD in social policy from Oxford University, where she also served as a tutor for undergraduate students. She's originally from Mexico. I reached out to Laura after watching a TEDx talk, which is called Things About a PhD Nobody Told You. And the talk has over 1.4 million views, and it is for an absolutely good reason. The link to this talk is in the show notes. And in this episode, we speak about the work you have to do to maintain a scholarship, how to do a PhD, the importance of building community, how a PhD differs from other levels of education, dealing with imposter syndrome. We ask the question, is motivation necessary and how to address moments of low motivation and so much more. You may need a pen and paper for this episode because it gets really practical. Um, And whether you're starting your PhD, whether you're thinking about doing one, whether you're currently doing one, this episode will absolutely have some great notes for you. So I hope you enjoy the show. Here I am with Laura. Thank you so much, Laura, for agreeing to do this interview and for finding the time to do it with me. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I think it's fun. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. We talked the other day, but yeah. now uh, Formula will say it again. So. <laughs> Thank it's you so pleasure. much. Thank you. Yeah, I really enjoyed watching your TED Talk. And uh, as I said, I found your TED, your TED Talk whilst I was preparing for, you know, trying to start my own DPhil journey. But before we get into that and the advice you've given people, I would like to know more about you and your academic journey as a way to introduce yourself to people. Tell us more about yourself, your academic journey, how you got to where you are today. Oh, thank you. So a little bit about me. I I am from Mexico. I always wear my uh, kind of Mexican flag, imaginary Mexican flag on my heart and my shoulder. So it's something very obvious. Uh, The research I do, a lot of it is in Mexico. I'm still in touch, obviously. Uh, not only with family and friends, but also academically. So I am from Mexico. I did all my undergrad in Mexico, um, international relations I did. I actually did an exchange program in Nottingham, and that was really, really good fun. It was good. Then I did a master's in public administration in Mexico. Then I came to the UK to do a master's in public policy in Latin America. I did that at Oxford. And I went back to Mexico for a year to do some work um, for a year. And then I came back from my PhD 
in social policy as well at Oxford. Um, I graduated in 2012, so a few years now. And uh, since then, I've been working at Loughborough. Now I have to say I did a postdoc in Lisbon. I tend to forget about that. And that was really good as well for a year. So yeah, between PhD and, and coming to Loughborough, I did a postdoc in Lisbon, then I came back. I was working at the Center for Research in Social Policy at Loughborough. And then I became a lecturer in January 2018. And I teach on social policy. So for modules on crime and social welfare, understanding social policy, research methods, dissertation workshops. And my research is around living standards, well-being, income, poverty, children. And we launched, this is the second year, we launched a master's in children, youth, and social policy. Um, so that's quite fun as well. It's really interesting. Um, and that's basically what I do. That's really cool. And you mentioned that most of your um, um, academic pursuits were actually on scholarship. And could you just tell us more about that and how it was for you, any challenges and hurdles you faced and how you were able to, to overcome them or how you wish you addressed them, particularly as, as a result of, of that? Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a funny one. It's not something that I like going around like bragging. Oh, yes, I've got a scholarship all my life because I'm so clever. <laughs> no, uh, because it's a lot of work as well. It is. But yeah, since I was in like primary school, I got a scholarship because I had very good grades. And then I was invited to do um, an international baccalaureate. You may have heard of it on a full scholarship. I did one uh, too. Because I had... it, it's, it's really good. It's tough. Um, <laughs> but again, I, I had very good grades. So I was invited to do that on a full scholarship. When I graduated, I graduated uh, first in class. So I did uh, my undergrad on a full scholarship as well. And then I graduated first in class, so I did my master's with a full scholarship. <laughs> but it's like, it's a lot of work. So it's not like, oh, I am super bright and I know a lot of things. I don't actually, I keep forgetting more and more. <laughs> but it's a lot of work and it's uh, wanting to like devote time and effort into your studies. So then when I came to do the master's in the UK, I did that with the Chevening Scholarship um, as well. That's a process of having good, not only good grades, but having a a good interview and a compelling argument of why you want to pursue these studies. And then I did my PhD under the funding of the Mexican government, similar procedure. Um, so having good academic background, but also showing how this is going to help uh, to improve the conditions in Mexico, how you're going to make a good career out of it kind of thing, <laughs> more or less. Um, so yes, I've, I've I've had a lot of like scholarships all throughout my life. Uh, and that comes, I guess it depends on the scholarship with some commitment. So in high school and university and the masters in Mexico, we had to do some um, work for the university. And it could be in many shapes. So it could help uh, professors finding literature for them. It could be, uh, what the hell did I do? do helping in the library, I think. So different kind of jobs kind of to, to give back because of that scholarship. The same with the Chivening, the same with the uh, funding from Mexico. So you had to give back. So either work in Mexico, work for someone in Mexico. So I, I was doing some work for Mexican institutions to give back kind of the knowledge you gained and as a thank you for, uh, for the funding. Um, so yeah, that's my turn. By the way, yeah. if anyone wants help with the procedures with the chevening or the procedures from your government or any other scholarships, I mean, you know a lot about it. But yeah, I'm happy to, to talk to anyone if they're interested because, you know, the paperwork and the Absolutely. intricacies of what to write, uh, it's a work in itself. Right? It's a job in itself. So I'm happy to talk about it as well. Absolutely. And you mentioned that one thing that you mentioned, I think that we generally tend to forget is the work that you have to put in, first of all, to actually find the scholarships. Um, it's not just about being quote unquote smart or having good grades, but also there's work that you have to do to maintain the scholarship. Um, sure. And, and that, that that's an ongoing work. That's something that is ongoing. And so 
My other question with regards to your academic journey, did you find that once you were in school, once you were in these institutions, there was something that, you know, were there any hurdles that, or challenges that you face as a result of being of someone who is on scholarship? Uh, for some people, mm-hmm. they find hurdles with regards to sort of like finances because the finances are limited uh, if they own specific types of scholarships or sometimes they might have work to do that is not necessarily you know, sub, um, aligned with with what they're doing, but they have to do it to maintain their scholarship. Is there any challenge that you face that's like that? And how did you address it? Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. So you can't just say, oh, that's great. I got my scholarship. I can, I can do and do my stuff. You have to maintain it. You're absolutely right. Um, so I'm thinking of the PhD because that's the most uh, recent uh, one for me. I'm, I'm getting old, so I'm forgetting. Um, but the, in the PhD, yes. So I got the scholarship and I had to keep up with the good work. And there, at least for the Mexican government at the time, there were, I think, annual reports uh, that you have to submit and show your progress. Um, and if everything's fine, then you can continue with your funding. I mean, you have to show progress to your university anyway, or to your institution anyway. That was kind of an extra layer of showing how you have progressed, or how you're making good use of the funding. Um, so you gain skills, I guess. Somehow you get to know what to write and to be efficient in proving the work you've done. Um, because it's, it's paperwork and you have to show this is what I've done. So it could be attending conferences, pieces of chapters. If you wrote an article already, say this has been published. So it's showing good track and you get better at doing these reports. Uh, but also keep in mind that you're not um, on your own. At least I was thinking, okay, I need I needed the signatures from my supervisors. So you can't rely on doing these reports uh, last minute and get it done and dusted because you need the agreement from your supervisor. So give them the chance to read the report, to make any comments and to sign it off in good time. So out of respect, give them a few days before and say, I. I need it by this date, not kind of, I need it by tomorrow morning, please sign it because otherwise yeah. my funding's running. So um, that's important as well. Another challenge is, I guess, uh, scholarships are not enough. <laughs> living, living is expensive. Uh, living standards are expensive in other cities more than, I mean, some cities more than others. Um, but I did have some jobs on the side as well. So I did some research projects small ones and they helped my career and they were really good. I gained skills, I gained knowledge, I gained contacts. Um, I did other jobs that weren't related, let's say. I was a tour guide, a costume tour guide. Um, I don't know if anyone would recognize me, but someone, I remember one of the comments I think in TripAdvisor said, oh, it's very funny how this tour guide has a Mexican accent. Well, yes. (laughs) Well, yes. Students find jobs, right? right. And I, I was really proud of my job. I really enjoyed it. I was there for three or more years or so. Um, and that, that also helped, I think, to having something different to do. Um, because doing your studies and the scholarship, it could be really stressful at times and it can be really um, kind of demanding. So having like something to switch your mind off to something else, that was really good. And also it was part of the... Um, so the things you, the things you do. Uh, I was part of the student body, which I gained a lot. So in itself is valuable if anyone's thinking of getting involved. And let's say the, the gain from being part of the student body and organizing events and making sure things were right in college um, was you, you get to choose, at least in St. Anthony where I was at, you could still stay in student accommodation because it was cars where I was. So usually a lot of first year students would get student accommodation on all of them. But by second year, virtually everyone had to find somewhere else to leave room for the first years, for the freshers. If you were in the student body, you could stay in college accommodation. And that made my life easier as well. Um, because the bills are paid for, uh, usually rent is cheaper than in the private sector. So it was, let's say, another job I was happily doing, but the benefit was that I could afford cheaper rent because the scholarship wasn't enough. 
so I always had to find ways of um, of, <laughs> of, of finishing and, and yeah. doing my thing. Yeah, it's true. There, there are a lot of ways that we have to find out how to balance life in general and the finances the financial aspect of 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 having a scholarship in as much as it thankfully provides the opportunity for you to be there there's still other things like living uh, that you have to worry about but now i want to shift the conversation back to um basically how to do a phd uh because your your talk your talk uh was things about a phd nobody told you about um what were the motive what were your motivations behind giving that talk uh what made you think that you know this would be because it's a very it's a very powerful talk but i want to know from your own journey what did you realize that that was missing that you needed to talk to people about and give people this advice oh thank you very much that's that's very kind of you um but i haven't looked at how many clicks i've got uh, lots last, uh, like last I think time i checked it was around a million yeah it's um, over, it's over a million few- <laughs> I don't know. And they're very nice comments. There are some nasty comments. So I guess um, if anyone's giving talks, you have to get used to it. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm deciding to ignore them because people have their lives and yeah. uh, you don't know what's behind a person. Um, so I appreciate <laughs> you, you following me through that. Um, my motivation was really, so when we were, when I was doing the PhD, we started, and this is very geek, but it was called the Poverty Journal Club. So I can say hello if, if they're listening to my friends from the Poverty Journal Club. <laughs> and basically we got together every week to discuss journal articles on the topic of poverty because all of us were kind of doing similar things. So we would discuss an article, um, but also it was kind of therapy. So if someone was writing an article, let's say, we would come and say, I have this draft. Are you happy to provide comments on it? Uh, or saying, I'm... I'm lost, I don't know what to do, I don't know how I'm doing my interviews, I don't know how to do this analysis, I am really anxious, I'm really stressed. So it was kind of therapy as well in that sense. And I found everyone was kind of very humble in admitting all these fears and challenges. Um, It would be quite easy, I guess, for some people to pretend that, oh, I know everything and I know what I'm doing. And then you, you dig a little bit and we all are lost. It's like, oh my goodness, a PhD. There's no path. I think I, I told you this when we talked informally. When you do your undergrad, when you do your master's, there's a path. So the professor say, this is the path kind of thing. You have to do this and, and you follow. And if you do it fine, you get good grades. And if not, it could be so-so, whatever. But it's rare occasions when you get to do that additional bit on your own. Of course you can, but in the PhD, there's no path at all. <laughs> so you have these questions, you have this project, and, and you have to find the path yourself. You have to build it. So from deciding what questions are important, what literature to include, what are the theories that are relevant, how are you going, what data do you need, how are you going to analyze it, and to make sense of it, there's no given. So in that Poverty Journal Club, I realized we all were kind of on the same boat thinking, oh, <laughs> I don't know anything about it. I need help. And everyone kind of got that extra layer of, uh, listen, maybe it was like an, a shield, right? Everyone took that one off and said, yes, I don't know where to start. I don't know how to do this. And then, so it was kind of very emotional. When I was finishing my PhD, obviously the journal club continued because there were new people arriving. And I wrote these items for that. I wrote this, oh, wait, I, wish I, could, I wish I knew these things when I was starting. Obviously, you learn those things along the way. And maybe it's a matter of people finding their own ways. But I think that was the motivation behind. So I wrote that for the journal club when I finished my PhD. Um, and then there was a call. I was at a Loughborough already working. And there was a call for a, for a TED event. And I said, like, any topic, right? So I made my application. I sent my, um, my proposal with the topics. And they interviewed me and said, oh, that's quite interesting. I said, yes, I think it is. <laughs> that's why I sent it. <laughs> um, and I thought, well, it could be appealing because it's kind of a general one, isn't it? So it's not specifically on poverty, not specifically on living standards or for child well-being, which was my area, but kind of more general 
something that could be helpful for, for students. Um, so again, going back to it, I think it's scary. I see, I saw kind of shooting numbers of the talk. I'm like, oh my God. But I know, because when you're doing a PhD, it could be quite lonely. Um, because you're the only one who's doing that, right? Like that very focused research. So I guess in that loneliness, people search for ideas and support and um, yeah, so that's how it happened. It was a really, really good talk. And like, I want to get into some of the things that you mentioned without necessarily repeating what's in the talk, but I'll put the link in the show notes so that the audience can just go there and, and really watch it, which I advise everybody to, um, to do. Um, but there were really some things that, that were pointing to that, that I'd like us to expand on. And one of the things is something that you just mentioned right now, which is about the PhD being a very lonely journey. Uh, mm. This actually might also be me being selfish because as I'm starting my PhD, I kind of do want to get as much advice as possible and just hope that my audience finds it useful. But really, you mentioned that, you know, the PhD is, is, is a very lonely journey. And that's something that I've heard a lot of people talk about. Um, and you do advise on building a community, which is something that you did with the Poverty Journal and things like that. What other advice do you have and tactics of how people can get away from that loneliness or can survive that loneliness um, of the PhD journey? It's mm. a very good question. And I think maybe I need a disclaimer on that um, because the experience in other countries may be different to the one in the UK. Um, sure from what I've heard from who have done their PhD in the US, it, that's more teamwork. And in some areas more than others. I think probably in engineering and uh, chemistry and biology, those, those kind of areas tend to be more teamwork. So there's big projects and then each person kind of does their own speciality. In social sciences, it tends to be very known. <laughs> um, because I don't know. I don't know why. <laughs> um, we do different kind of questions. We do kind of different kind of research. Um, so it's lonely in the sense that you're the only one who's doing specifically that thing. So maybe in that sense, that's shared across any field. Like not even your supervisor will know as much as you do because you'll be reading and you'll be thinking about it and writing about it and going through it again and again. So you become the expert. And that's quite scary as well. Even if it's a tiny thing of the whole yeah. human knowledge, but you're the expert on that tiny bit. And that's why it could be lonely because you want to talk about it. And yeah, there's people who, who will share part of it, but the, the journey in itself, you're the only one experiencing those things, experiencing that, oh, that bright moment or that, oh, I don't know what to do moment. So... I guess find, find friends. Um, so it could be formal and organized, like I had the journal club, or it could be more informal and uh, talk to friends about it, about the process, about the content. So you can find friends you, or colleagues, you can talk about the content in itself. Like, oh, how do you measure income? Oh, I measure it this way. Oh, did you equivalize this way? So it's kind of very technical, particular way, but also about the process. So... Because don't be scared of talking about it. And also there's obviously channels, kind of well-being and um, well-being advisors, uh, some like official support from the university on mental health. If you really need your help and you're struggling, you can always um, ask them. And as your supervisor, and I think, especially when, when someone's starting their PhD, at least I did, kind of, oh my goodness, like the supervisors, um, and then you realize, um, well, they know a lot, yes, because they've been doing that for years, but also they're people. So mm, chances are they're going to understand your struggles. And, and I think supervisors tend to be nice. I had a very great experience. Um, now that I'm supervising, I'm trying to be nice <laughs> as well. <laughs> um, because, yes, you, you want people to do their job, but if people are not okay, the job's not going to get done. And I think especially these times when everyone's struggling and there's challenges everywhere, like caring responsibilities, health issues, mental health issues, people who have lost someone or just stressed or worried about the whole situation, it could be overwhelming. 
So don't be scared of talking to your supervisor as well and say, I need some time off or I need a break or I need help on this. Um, don't pretend. I think that's maybe the recipe for not being lonely. Don't pretend that you know it all and that you can do it all on your own. Um, and accept help. Well, this is something that you didn't necessarily mention in the talk, but you've just talked about right now, which is how scary it is. Um, part of it, the question that I have for you is people talk about imposter syndrome. People talk about, you know, starting something and not, and not being sure if you fit in, not being sure if you, you really deserve to be there. Mm -hmm. How does one deal with it? Because you, I actually felt myself get scared when you mentioned the, the term expert, like you become an expert. And I'm like, no, is that, that can't be. I, I don't think I can ever be that. Um, and it's just very scary, right, to, to, to think that you are, there's this is expectation that you will know quite a lot of things. How do you advise people that are doing their PhD currently or that are about to start their PhDs or hoping to do their PhDs? Or really, honestly, anybody that is getting into academia at any stage, how do you advise people to deal with this imposter syndrome, especially people that come from like marginalized backgrounds or different backgrounds to the countries that you're studying in? Um, wish I knew. <laughs> 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 I think that never fades, that never goes away. Um, most people I met, we all are like, am I the expert, really? Um, but you may know some things and not others. Um, so I guess maybe finding a, finding a balance in saying, yes, I know some things, I don't know others. Uh, it's not a matter of knowing everything about it or being the best person ever in that field. Because even so, there are things you don't know. There are things we don't know. I don't know if there's a way to shake that feeling off. Um, but accept, I guess, accept that, okay, yes, I am in a scary environment. Because there's people who tend to like, talk and you're like, oh my goodness, now, nah. like, they know about everything. I have friends like that. Like, they're kind of a walking encyclopedia. And like, oh my goodness. Um, but then when you get to know them, there's all this stuff they don't know. So it's daunting, like, oh, that big project and that, you know, I have, am I going to be the expert on that field? Um, but just keep on working, I guess. Uh, keep on working and, and accept, I guess, <laughs> know yeah. you things and, and you don't know other things. Yeah. Um, that's true. Okay. I don't know really. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it's okay. I mean, I, I guess it's a tough question, right? Because you did say it's, it's something that doesn't necessarily always go away. Um, and it's a process. Um, so it was, it was just a question that just came to my mind right now. Um, one of the things that you mentioned in the talk is with, with regards to motivation. Like sometimes when you think I don't have any motivation for this, or you, you just feel like you're not inspired to do the work and a PhD you said, and has been said by a lot of other people is a marathon. It's not a sprint. Um, could you dive more into that? And how do people, how do you advise that people consistently find the motivation or create the motivation? Or is it even necessary to have motivation at some point <laughs> once you started? Um, and how did you go about that? That's a good point. Um, so motivation, I guess you need it because it's a huge project. You're going to be working on it for three or four years. I ended up doing mine in four because it was more complex than I thought. Uh, so you need, I think you need to split it in small chunks and to tick those boxes. And I think I talk about it in the, in the TED talk be able to say this is done for me that was really helpful because otherwise it's like imagine you enter into a room and it's full of mess I'm like where do I start how how do I start cleaning this thing isn't it so maybe you put your laundry away first then maybe you look at what socks have holes and you put them aside uh, or maybe you're like oh this uh, I don't know these uh, papers can go into the rubbish bin so little by little because otherwise it's too much. The same with the PhD. So you think, oh my goodness, it's three, four years. 
um, where do I start? How do I keep on going? So split it into small chunks. Celebrate the achievements. So it's good to celebrate, even if it's, uh, I don't know, finishing a journal article sometimes. Because sometimes you read and like, whoa, I'm not really understanding. So getting to finish it and understand like, yes, celebrate it because you deserve it. Um, um, doing something else also helps, I think. Like when I mentioned I was a tour guide, so just having that feeling of that day is over, that helped me. Okay, that's finished. Like having that sense of something's finished. <laughs> um, or it could be doing a piece of art or, or growing a plant or something else that you feel done. So I can keep on going with the big thing. Um, that's how I found to keep on the motivation. And then obviously there are some nice comments from him, coming from family and friends who are like, oh, wow, you're doing that thing. And that goes back maybe to the previous point. Believe those comments. So if people say, wow, that's great. You're doing this PhD on this, or wow, it's great. Uh, you, got, uh, you got to present, even if it's a small conference in, in your own department. If people say, oh, great, that, that's fantastic. Believe that. And, and take that and accept it. Um, then we all deserve we all deserve to be recognized, even if it's uh, in little steps. So um, that helps also as motivation. Um, maybe having something to look forward to. So even if it's a student conference, having that goal and saying, "Oh yes, I achieved that," or having a poster conference, or having um, obviously if there's kind of a formal assessment as well so look forward to that to that assessment and celebrate when you <laughs> when you finish so so you can keep on going that's that, that's really um i think very practical advice which is which is great which is what i was looking for like something that people can actually listen to and say oh i can do that i can grow a plant or you know i could and i remember one of the things that you told me when we spoke before before the interview was you 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 remember walking past like a reading room or a library and seeing people studying mm -hmm. but you chose to actually continue to go to a party that was being held part of you was wondering should i not go but that's not you, you actually have better memories of being there and taking the time out to do something else. That's not necessarily. Yeah, that's right. You know? That's right. And that's <laughs> a very, very, um, it was around Christmas time. So it was cold and dark. And even it was like 5.30 or 6 and it was dark. So in the UK, it's already pitch dark at As that time. Be, yeah. So, and I remember I walked by, it was, it was a Christmas dinner from my work when I was a tour guide. And I could see my friends through the window, like typing and reading and really concentrating. And I passed by and I thought, I'm going to this, to this party. It's like, maybe I should be studying. Maybe I should be like sitting like them. And then I realized, well, it's, it's okay. It's okay to have a life. It's okay to do something else. I went, I had fun. Um, I came back. And in the end, I have my PhD. They have their PhDs. We have lives. We have families and other things going on. So. So it's okay. Like don't like don't go and and punish yourself. Like oh no, I'm not. Uh, right. I'm not doing it as much as my friend because you don't know individual circumstances. Uh, I think that's a it's a trap very easy to fall. Saying oh I'm not working as much as this other person who's submitted a chapter already and I haven't. Well, you don't know what's behind. Right. So in the end, it's a very. That's why again, it's very lonely. It's very personal that journey. Uh, like your pace, your rhythm, sometimes you'll be better, sometimes you'll be slower, sometimes you'll be really stuck, and sometimes you go like, woo! So, so make the most of it, and, and that's part of uh, how to keep the motivation as well. Oh, and before I forget, I think that's also part of the talk, having a diary. And that was yeah. really the best advice. <laughs> that was really the best advice, I think, from my supervisor. Uh, he said, keep a research diary. And that was literally a notebook saying, oh, uh, I read this and this and this, or I considered these theories, or then when I went into variables and coding, these variables mean this, these variables mean that, oh, I changed, I deleted this because of this and this and this. So in on the one hand, it's, it's kind of good practice, so you have a record 
of decisions of why you coded that variable. Let's say if it was a green and the original scale was from one to 10, and then you change that into one to five. So why did you make the decision? So that's good practice for your methodology chapter and for the analysis, so it's all correct. But <laughs> it's also to keep up with the motivation, I think. Because let's say in six months time, you go back to your beginning of your diary like, oh, oh, I didn't understand that. Now I know. Look at the progress I've done. I think somewhere I still have my diary from my PhD. I haven't seen it in a few years, but I'm sure if I see it now, I'll be like, I was so silly. I was so, I was really worried about this and oh, come on, it's so easy. So that's kind of yeah, so right. pat on the shoulder for yourself. <laughs> That that is very practical. Um, to, just to uh, before I go back to something, now that you've brought up the research diary as part of building motivation, how often did you write in it? Did you have a specific format? Um, did you write it by hand? What and did you ever check it? Like, did you read back? Was it just almost like journaling for personal reasons? Except this particular one was for your research. Um, I saw. So Maybe it's my way of doing things. Uh, I did it by hand and I didn't have a method, let's say like every Friday or every day. It was kind of more when needed. Um, so it was literally a, a, a little notebook like this, green. <laughs> um, and then I, I started to write this and this and this and this. And I'm very visual as well. So I would use the markers into, oh, this is kind of, this is a great decision. So I wouldn't forget. Um, but I guess it depends on the person. If someone feels they need to write it every day at the end of the day, this is what I did, great. If you feel like, oh, whenever needed, great. Again, so it's a very personal choice. Uh, I did it by hand, with pen, with the markers, uh, with circles and arrows and things just to kind of to show my flow of thought. Um, but I did revisit it um, while I was doing my, my, my thesis to know, okay, oh, how, what did I say about looking into this theory? Oh, that's right. Um, so it could be helpful notes as well um, in that sense. Sure, sure. Thank you very much for that. I was just asking just, you know, as, so that we get a lot more, more practical. But one thing that I do want to go back to is, when we talk about the journey and when we talk about it being a marathon and you mentioned not comparing yourself to other people. And what's interesting is that yes, it's a marathon, but it's not a race as in it's not, you're not competing against anyone. Right. Mm -hmm. In as much as you're doing it with a lot of people, you know, some, and that's something that is very useful to remember that, you know, you will see people do something doesn't necessarily apply to you or it may apply to you, but very differently. It's, it's this weird thing where, you know, it's, you, you're, you're in a cohort or you're in a group or you're in a lab, but it's not a race. And so You're, you're right. Yeah. yeah, absolutely right. Um, because each research project is different. Each person's different. It may sound a cliche, but it's right. Even if you answered the same research questions, you would do it in a very different way in a different, with different angles, different theories, uh, different data. So, and that leads to not being a race, that leads to an individual path. So it's like steady, steady, like do a lot of work. I'm not saying it's not a lot of work, it is. <laughs> so it is motivation, it is uh, pampering yourself on the shoulder, it is support, but it is also a lot of work because otherwise you don't get a PhD, you only get the experience, right? Right. Um, but you're absolutely right. You're not competing against uh, each other. Um, some friends may finish before you. Some friends won't. I mean, the universities, I think all of them, will have some kind of checks to keep you at pace, right? So there's supervision meetings. There's official procedures to make you progress. And roughly, someone like two or three people who start at the same time they'll be progressing roughly at the same time. But obviously things may get complicated. So in my own PhD, I did an extra year. I had an extension of one year because the data was handling 
it was too raw, let's say, in that sense. So I had to make a lot of changes in the variables. It was too complicated. Um, plus, I had to learn new methodology. I had to learn new software. I had to learn <laughs> new theories, uh, new fields even I've never gone into. So for me, it was one extra year. For some friends, it was three years. For some friends, they had another extension afterwards. So, And it's okay, I guess. Uh, it's just knowing that one day you'll finish and you'll do it and uh, and be proud of it whatever right. whatever it took right absolutely and i think what what i've heard is that generally a lot of people actually end up getting some extension of some sort you know like um i think at the in the uk or at oxford specifically they will say three years but i've when doing my research i was told that I actually expect four sometimes even five even as a full-time student right um, and the U.S., I know people have been told five years, but some people have been told actually seven. Um, <laughs> you know, so I think I think it's okay to know that time is not necessarily doesn't necessarily work the way you sort of want it to work in this journey as yeah. well. And that's important to remember. Um, is there anything else before we I go into like rapid fire questions? Is there anything that you really wish I'd asked you, or any anything that you really want to talk about in terms of? I guess generally just how to how to PhD. <laughs> Not really, just on that last comment. So if I use my um, my hat from my employer, <laughs> so as a supervisor, yes, there's there's pressures to for for various reasons to make students finish in three years in the UK. I know in the US they say four or five. Um, and there's reasons behind it, how the universities work, how funding works, uh, the pressures on supervisors on, let's say, finishing things on time. If I take that hat off, and I'm speaking on my personal experience, um, I think that sometimes hurts students um, because the expectation could be unrealistic. So, you're absolutely right. Knowing that even though officially it's three years, it may take four, knowing that helps. Because that takes some of the pressure off. So when I did mine, it was three years funding, three years program. Yes, I was supposed to finish in three years. By the end of the second one, it was clear I wasn't going to finish in one extra year. So we applied for an extension. Um, and my supervisor was very supportive of that. He said, yes, you have a very complex project. You don't have to find like additional reasons of why you're asking for an extension because I was asking for an extension for the scholarship as well. Uh, he said, it's a complex project. He helped me to write the support and I got it. I got it, I mean, the university said it's okay and the scholarship said it's okay. And I finished in four years. Um, so I guess, some advice for someone who's starting or is in about that stage. Yes, get in mind that you're supposed to finish in three years, at least in the UK, right? But if you feel like that's going to be a problem, talk about it with your supervisor early. Um, and early, I mean during the first year. Because it could be also like caring responsibilities, like people who have children, who have parents, grandparents, a partner who's so well, and these things um, can deviate you from the path. So talk to your supervisor early if you feel like three years is not going to be enough. Chances are the result is going to be better for everyone rather than pretending, yes, I'm going to do it in three years, and then comes to it and, oh, no, actually, I need an extra year. Sure. So I think that's um, some advice. Um, and that, that's it. I don't know. What else? Yeah, no, I, you actually mentioned something that I had forgotten to ask you, which is you are now a supervisor as well and, and a lecturer. What perspective have you gained? What other new perspectives have you gained by being on the other side of, the, of, of, of this? Um, I've gained, maybe because I've been on both sides, that, like, student and supervisor we all are people and we all have families and concerns and personal circumstances 
and it's okay to bring them into the PhD, I think. Uh, it's okay to, to see as a whole thing. So not the PhD as a separate from your life because it's your life for four years. So I think that's what I've gained. So now with my students who are doing a PhD, I'm very aware of their lives. So if they say, oh, I cannot submit this on time for any reason, give me another week, it's fine. Although I have to say they're very good <laughs> in, <laughs> in submitting things. Uh, but I know if they said, oh, I need an extra month because of COVID, now I'm home looking after my children, whatever, it's okay, it's okay. So I guess I've gained that perspective. Um, yeah, supervisors can learn a lot from, from students as well. So I think it's a, it's a myth that the supervisor knows a lot and the student is learning from them. It's a mutual, mutual process of learning. And that's, that's really, that's really appealing. So I like my job. I think that reminder is also important. That reminder that it's mutual is important, not just for supervisors. It's also important for students. And I'll say this as somebody that's coming in as a student. I, I have, I've been in touch with my supervisor now, obviously, even though uh, as we are recording this, I haven't started my, my, my DFIL. And just him sort of giving me that space to actually, you know, for him to say, oh, can you recommend this, these things for me? It has, has, has reminded me that, oh, wait, <laughs> this, this is mutual. <laughs> you know, and because he's somebody that I respect a lot and whose work I really enjoy, it has been very helpful for him to come to me and say, oh, can you, can you give me a list of books and articles you think I should read? And I'm like, wait, me, <laughs> you know, um, but, but that is something that, that is helpful even for students when supervisors, when supervisors remind them that, look, we, we are, we're, this, this is mutual. Um, you know, in as much as I'm teaching you something, you are teaching me something as well, because I, I am in this field. I need to learn and grow as well with you. Um, and so I think that, that, that is something that is very helpful. Um, yeah. And you saying it as a supervisor as well, like, is obviously great. And I hope other supervisors that will listen to this will also hear that. I think the, the ones I've, I've met and the ones I know, they are like that. I think people in academia like to learn. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a matter of keep growing and keep learning. And because the, the field, there's new things. There's, uh, so the field kind of evolves. There's new things coming up. Uh, people are coming from different backgrounds with different perspectives. So you always learn. And, um, and that's great. It's a great job. Um, and one of the things that you also mentioned is about like being human. I think I'm grateful now. I think mostly thanks to social media that people are now seeing academia and academics and are showing how human it is. Of course, there's still challenges, right? When we look at you know, how when we look at people talking about like black in the ivory or, you know, all of that stuff that's happening, there's still challenges, but I'm really grateful that you can actually follow an academic whom you read, like who writes really complex papers sometimes and just see yeah. them on Twitter and just be like, oh, they, wait, they're actually a person. They have kids, they have a family, they have jokes, yeah. you know, <laughs> and, and it's really great. And just to show that they're, they're in the world, um, which is something I think back in the day wasn't really there and it's now becoming more and more, even more expected, I, I think, um, yeah. which I really appreciate. Um yeah, and, and, and people are accessible, generally. So don't be scared. I used to be like, oh, how, do I, how do I send an email to that person? Like, ooh. Um, just, like, just email them or just tweet them or just tag them in a tweet or, or, um, or any other platforms. I'm, I'm not using many, but um, <laughs> yeah. I use Twitter a lot. And sometimes it's just a matter of saying, oh, look at this. Or I found your work. If, if it's... Um, I've done it as well when I was a student. Uh, someone and they wrote a book and you really like it and say, oh, I just thought of sending you an email. Like, I really enjoy your book. Could you recommend any other things? And people are usually accessible. Um, even if they're like these top professors, people are usually willing to help and, and to, right. to talk to you. So. Right. Which is how this interview came to be actually as well, right? Like I, I didn't even expect you to respond. I was like, okay, this TED talk has over a million views. And <laughs> let me just try my best and send an email. But you're right, it, 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 it happens and it turns out like super amazingly. Um, and so just, you know, as people say, shoot your shot, just, just ask. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, 
yeah yes 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 do and, yeah uh, people are usually nice <laughs> so um, yeah that's the thing yeah absolutely well thank you so much uh honestly for the great advice and the great interview and it's very practical um for me as well and i i know a lot of people that listen to this will get something from it i want to end on rapid fire questions basically they they are to do with necessarily nothing on how to phd or anything like that but before we get into that where can uh, our audience find you um and learn more about your work or just get in touch with you if they would like people can get in touch with me if you if i don't know if you're gonna share my work address or something uh if you Google my name, Laura Valadez Martinez, I am the only one in the world. <laughs> um, so I work at Loughborough. You can find my email over there, Loughborough University. It's very difficult to spell. <laughs> and if after three or four years, yeah, kind of after three years of working there, I could say Loughborough and people say, what? So I'm kind of more or less mastering how to say it. Uh, it's close to Leicester. <laughs> if you Google it in, in the map, um, I mean, if you Google me or in Twitter, I'm basically now tweeting about plants. That's great. Um, <laughs> so if you're interested in gardening. Like, oh. yeah. But yeah, please do get in touch with me. Uh, Absolutely. I'll, I'll put all of that in the show notes as well. And as I said before, I will put a link to your, to your, to your talk um, so that people can see where this conversation came from as well. Okay, so are you ready for all of these random questions? Ah, I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> they're they, they actually like, they, they aren't difficult. Everybody says they're scared and then they're actually pretty fun. Uh, like, but okay. Where are they coming from? <laughs> yeah, so let's begin. So I think the first thing I want to know is we're in the middle of a global pandemic right now, in the middle or in the whatever. Honestly, it's been such a long year. But what are you currently enjoying that is giving you that is bringing you delight and joy amidst all of this? I think my family. My family. Um, this is very too personal, but we have a very fine arrangement of commuting. <laughs> commuting and balancing. I have two children, so school and nursery and uh, both works. And being at home all together, I think is the best part of the pandemic, if anything good at all. Um, I had to cancel a flight to Mexico to see my family. Um, most of my family don't know my baby yet. Aww. So that's, uh, that's the sad part, but at least we're, so my husband, my two children and myself, we're, in, we're at home. Um, we're lucky enough to be able to keep working from home. So that's the, I think the good part in my family. That's really great. Um, and what are you currently are you currently reading anything or watching anything? How are you spending? And, 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 and how, what would you recommend people read or watch right now just to get away? Oh, uh, my goodness. Um, so, El Quixote, that's in Spanish. Okay. <laughs> the Very Hungry Caterpillar. I should know that one. Uh, Owl Babies. <laughs> The Bad Temper Lady Bird. <laughs> There's only a few. And here we are. Um, Oliver Jeffers. This is my son's favorite at the moment. And you can oh, wow. see. I, I was going uh, to say. This is his bedroom. Background. Yeah. This is his bedroom. Uh, so that's what I've been reading, uh, really. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's good to go back sometimes, you know, spending time with, 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 with kids and young people sometimes just actually gives you a perspective on the world that is much better than adult perspectives because um, it's, it's, it's unfiltered, it's unhindered, and it's just full of so much awe. So it's good to read those, uh, those children's books. It's really relaxing, actually. It is, and I have to say, um, most of this, um, because it's a, uh, literature in English, I didn't grow up with. Uh, so I'm, I'm new to them. I mean... In the last four years or so, I'm knowing more and more children's books in English. Um, so it's good. Um, apart from that, it's tough for my lectures. Yeah. Um, but not much, to be honest. <laughs> no, <laughs> for pleasure, it's just this. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's really good. Um, and another question is, what one thing has come up for the world or has come up for you as a result of this pandemic that you hope that we keep in the future? Oh, my goodness. I hope, I hope we learn to be kind to each other. 
uh, so you can see great example of, examples of people being kind around the world, uh, supporting each other in different ways. Still, I know there's some people who, like, I don't know, how can you be so egocentric? <laughs> right. So I hope as humankind, we'll, we'll learn to be kind, <laughs> hopefully. Right, right, that's true. I think uh, kindness is one of the things that has come up as to being essential to survival today, you know, helping, you know, people that we know are immunocompromised or at risk or can't afford mm -hmm. to, you know, work mm -hmm. from home or you know, ETC, things like that. Um, usually mm -hmm. I do have a last question about like, if you had, you know, like $5 to your name right now, would you spend it on? But you mentioned something else. That, so I'm going to change that question and ask you about gardening and plants. Why? <laughs> <laughs> and how is that going? <laughs> so I think, I've always said I like plants since I was a kid. Um, but now, since lockdown, um, I found myself with like extra time because I wasn't commuting to work. So we said, okay, let's, I don't know, let's, let's spend time. We spent a lot of time in the garden. We're lucky enough to have a garden. Uh, we were lucky to have a nice weather, like nice spring, nice summer in the UK. So... I just got more and more into gardening. I'm not, I'm not saying I have a perfect garden, but I'm learning new names of plants and, and I had a battle with the slugs, so they wouldn't eat it. So I put my seeds and then they were kind of coming out, these tiny little plants and just going out every night and take the slugs away so they wouldn't eat them. And um, yeah, that's what I'm doing. I, I grew tomatoes and I grew zucchinis jets whatever you call them uh grapes they're coming through uh cucumber this year just didn't survive this lot um that was a shame but lots of flowers and um you know my pro one of my projects was um wildflowers for the bees you know like save the bees and help the bees right. so now i have a, a little patch of wildflowers coming through and they're very nice and i go and photograph the bees so if you go on my twitter now it's full of flowers and tomatoes and, and bees <laughs> that's really good that's really funny uh, well thank you so much for doing this interview and i appreciate you taking the time uh that's all i had for today and i really hope the audience gets to get something from this well thank you very much I, i've enjoyed it and it's been great to meet you and uh, i know you have a lot of audience so hopefully they're not scared of pursuing a PhD or, or any dream or anything they want to do. Um, just go for it. And I mean, we have to try and uh, it's part of the, it's part of the learning process, I guess. True. Sure, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for listening to this episode. It was so much fun speaking with Dr. Laura, who honestly continues to be a great resource even after we recorded this episode. Tell us what you think about the show, any questions you may have or anything else that got you thinking and resonated with you in this episode. We are at TEDx Media on Twitter and Instagram. Alternatively, do send us an email, sigspodcast at gmail.com. Dr. Laura's information is in the show notes, so tag her, follow her, ask her questions, and also, like she said, do reach out to her if you have any questions. Also, check out her TEDx talk. Link is in the show notes as well. And finally, finally, do check out our Patreon page or our website. Get that merch. Leave us a review. Support the show. All of that good and fun stuff. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. It's been great. It's been fun. Thank you for giving us your time and your attention. Until next time, keep dreaming, be kind, and be you. <laughs>